Maybe soon. Church. It's always beautiful to listen to you sing. I know there's not enough room down here at the front for more of, of you to, to roost. And I know that everyone has their comfortable place to be. But uh, it, uh, the singing is, you just hear it better down here. Maybe because everyone's aimed this direction. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tonight, beginning with verse 29. And we're going to just cover a few verses tonight. Wanted to give us time to, uh, to spend a little bit of time here in verse 29. And what, one of the things that, that uh, we're going to see, and I don't want to go too much into it, uh, has to do with uh, the lessons that uh, uh, I told you that we were going to be uh, looking at on on a Sunday mornings beginning um, the, uh, the 16th of this month, the Lord allowing time to continue and us to live, uh, about uh, uh, how do we handle God's Word? Uh, how, how do we arrive at, at the, uh, uh, the understanding of, of, of His commandments? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, all, there's, there, there's so much that is there. Uh, and this, this morning, as, uh, as we pointed out, it, it's so important it, it's, it's so important that we keep things in context. Just all over the place. Uh, you know, leave, leave things in, in, in the context uh, where they are. Uh, and if, if you don't find satisfaction within the context, uh, within uh, the, the verses before and the verses after, then read all of the chapter and the chapters before and after, and then read the entire book. Uh, because it may be that uh, that what you're you're looking at uh, will will have uh, uh, have bearing on on the entirety of that book, and if you, and if you're not satisfied there, uh, then then read similar passages that that talk about the same or or, or similar things or use uh, very similar words and, and the language that's there. Let let God tell us what what He's talking about before people began uh, to inject their ideas and. And uh, but even at that, we're we're going to reach a point in in uh, in some instances where we just simply don't know any more than than what we're told. Uh, in fact, in all cases, we don't know any more than what we're told. Uh, and uh, so, but but first, give God a chance to tell us uh, what to think. Uh, and and there are there are places where God gives us a command, but yet He does not tell us how to go about doing it. Uh, and, and we see from Scripture when we're studying about like, uh, and, and here I go. Here I, no, I don't want to go very deep into that. Uh, but from, uh, from Scripture, the Lord tells us about uh, uh, instituting the Lord's Supper on the night of His betrayal. And, and then we, f- we have other New Testament references to that. Uh, and then uh, even, even some places where uh, it, it would be very safe uh, to to assume reasoning behind some of the things. Uh, God tells us that, uh, uh, that there was a way to, to go about that, to take of the Lord's Supper. Uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, in talking about God's order and, and the, the I- important to, uh, to keep God where He is, the, the Father, the Son, man, woman. Uh, and then uh, in, in the, uh, the worship assembly uh, that, that was taking place, uh, the, the attitude in our heart, uh, us... Uh, stopping and, and really, when, when God talks about discerning, that, that's a big word. Uh, he, he really wants us to give serious thought to what uh, he's talking about in those instances. Uh, and, uh, uh, but th- and that gives us more information, but then we have to go to uh, places where God has revealed even more, as, uh, as in Acts uh, uh, 20 and, and verse 7, uh, where uh, whenever he was meeting with the church there, uh, they came together on the first day of the week to break bread. The, the very purpose, the, the timing of it uh, was, was significant. Of course, it was significant that, that uh, the timing of, it, of its institution was uh, Jesus uh, taking of the Passover uh, with his apostles. He, he, he wanted to be there with them uh, and use that uh, as a continuing thread uh, of the bloodline uh, that we follow through the, the Word of God until we get to uh, the cross of Jesus. Uh, so, you know, look at that. But there are also places like in uh, uh, James chapter 1 uh, where God tells us uh, that, uh, that pure religion 
the, the, the godly life, the godly worship uh, from the heart of a person uh, that, that is, is without fault, pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction uh, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So God talks about a priority there. Uh, and it's a consistent priority. You go back all through the Bible and you'll find God talking about the significance of, of, of widows and orphans in his eyes. Uh, that, that he hears their cries and, and he, he's always watching over them. And, and uh, he, he gives us very, very specific commandments there to, uh, to make sure that, that the widows and the orphans are not neglected. But he doesn't tell us how to do that. I mean, you can read all through the Scripture, and God doesn't tell us how, how to go about doing that. And, and so uh, there, there is a very direct command, but then uh, left up to, uh, to, you know, you don't, don't violate any other passage uh, or any other commandment in your, your following through on this, uh, but pretty much left up to our own discretion as to how we do that. And, and so it, it's interesting uh, what we'll be looking at. But I want you to begin with me tonight. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 29 through verse 34, and, and look, look at what God is saying here, or listen to what he is saying here. And, he, and he's talking about, uh, of course, the resurrection. The resurrection. And, and he says, Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you, uh, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with, uh, if from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me if the dead are not raised? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded, as you ought, and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He's talking about the resurrection of the dead. There's not another chapter in all of the Bible that, that goes into as much detail uh, about the significance of the resurrection uh, of the dead. And, and so there, there's some obvious things that we ought to be drawing from this because it's right smack dab in the middle of, of this powerful chapter on the resurrection. And, and he begins by, in chapter uh, 15 in the first couple of verses by saying that this is very much a part of of the gospel message that and you can walk it backwards uh, that uh, uh, you know the, the resurrection of the dead you know uh, if, if we don't get there we don't get anywhere but the resurrection of the dead meant that Jesus had to die there has to be a death before there can be a resurrection of bringing something out and, and so you walk it backwards and, and you and you find the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ that that he uh, he, he died for our sins, that he was buried, and both of those according to the Scripture, and that he was raised on the third day. That's, that's the gospel. Don't let anyone take that away from you. Either the death, the burial, or the resurrection of Jesus. And, and he says, so if, if the dead are not raised, here we come to, to, to verse 29. The three things I, I hope that we'll see here. No, number one, number one, and it, it's going to be really hard if you've already got your, your, in, in your own mind the idea of, of what this means. Uh, it, it's hard for us to, to come with a blank slate. It's hard for me to study with a blank, blank slate because I've, I've got years and years and years of studying and, and arriving at conclusions and, and then to, to look at it fresh. But let's give God a chance to speak here tonight. When he's talking about baptism for the dead, God is you. This isn't just Paul writing. But this is God writing to make a case for the resurrection of the dead. Everything he is saying in this chapter is to make valid the teaching of the resurrection from the dead. And so there is a strong connection. There's a strong connection with the resurrection of the dead. God is trying to make a point here. And, and, and the point that he is making is that there is resurrection from the dead. And, and so keep that in mind as we read. And God does not condemn the practice. At this point, I'm going to say whatever it means when God says uh, of, of people who are being baptized for the dead. God does not condemn that. Paul does not condemn that. He has no problem condemning sin. He and he'll do that in our reading tonight at, when we get past verse 33. 
as he did also uh, in when he's talking about the Lord's Supper over in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, or as he did with, with a young man and, and the whole church that was a young man, or not a young man, yeah, a young man who was living with his father's wife. And, and, he, and he calls the church out on these things. And, and, and he says, what, what you're doing is you're sinning. In fact, the word that he'll use quite often when, whenever he exposes sin, either in thought or in practice, is he said, it's a shame. It's a shame what you're doing. Now, when he's talking about the Lord's Supper earlier in chapter 11, he says, I say this to your shame. You don't come together for the better. You come together for the worse. I say this to your shame. And he's going to bring that same thought out again tonight in, in, in the context of our reading. And, and so God is not, God nor Paul are condemning this. And so that should get our attention. That God doesn't say, uh, else why are those uh, baptized for the dead? It's a shame that you even talk that way. It's a shame that you would practice something that way. So it may be in our reading and it may be in our hearing. So, so be careful with this one. And, and number three, uh, as, as also connected with number one, but somewhat different, uh, this must have the resurrection in view. All, all of this chapter is coming back to the resurrection. And if, it doesn't have, if it's not connected with the resurrection, then, then Paul is, 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 is away from his theme. No, not his theme. He's, he's stepping outside of God's theme. Just like 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is dealing with, with uh, potential problems and real problems that come up uh, in, in marriage, whether you're single and, and, and want to marry, or, or whether uh, you're, you're single and you don't marry, or whether you're married and, and they've been married for a long time, you're married and you're separated or you're divorced. There is no separation, uh, no, no uh, just being separated. It, they, 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 that just doesn't happen. Either you're married or you're not. Either you're married or you're not. And, and people talk about that. But in God's language, there isn't just a, a, a separation unless it is just for a period of time that a couple will give themselves to prayer and then they'll come back together. Uh, so, so there is no... Uh, when someone comes and says, well, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're having problems. We think we should separate for a while. No. No. Uh, and it is true if, if you revise the, the, the saying that we've all heard, absence makes the heart grow fonder. For someone else, if you're separated. Absence doesn't just make the heart grow fonder. Absence makes the heart grow fonder for someone else if the one you're supposed to be with isn't around for a long period of time. So, so stay with me on those, those, those three points. And uh, of everything, whenever he, he starts talking about baptism, that ought to get our attention. And there's some other passages that we could look at that really ought to get our attention. Hebrews chapter 6 is one of them. In Hebrews chapter 6, uh, he, is, he is saying, it's time that we move on. It's time that we move on from these foundational teachings that brought us to Jesus. And then he talks about faith, repentance, and baptism. And we're going, okay, that's, that's talking to, to, to Christians. Well, he is talking to Christians, but whenever he talks about baptism in Hebrews chapter 6, he uses the plural form. Man, that ought to get everybody's attention in, in the church. I mean, if you've been in the church any time at all, it, it, and if, if you've been taught uh, as, as God wants us to be taught, uh, and you've been taught about baptism, that's got to be part of it. Uh, anytime you see a, an S on the end of, of baptism, and, and you make it plural, He's really dating what he's talking about. He doesn't have to say it to, to those who are, who are grounded in the Scripture. The Scriptures say it because there is only one baptism. Isn't that right, church? There is only one baptism. And we'll see that in just a moment when we read what you already all know. And so, since there is only one baptism, and God only talks about it in the singular, any time that God refers to baptisms plural, we know he's talking about the Old Testament because there were all kinds of baptisms, plural, in the Old Testament. There were all kinds of ceremonial washings. There were all kinds of, of complete cleansing. And, and there are examples back there of, of the, the complete uh, submersion of, of people as, uh, as uh, uh, Naaman the, the leper 
uh, w- was told to go and dip himself uh, in the Jordan River. Uh, and so that, you know, that should get our attention. So when we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 29, and, and God starts talking about baptism, or he, he, he mentions baptism here, that, number one, should get our attention. All right, he's, he is using something that we should be familiar with to teach the doctrine of the resurrection. So you go to Ephesians chapter 4 and listen to what God says. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 5, or, or, or verse 4, uh, verse 4 and 5. Uh, there, there is, or, or verse 4, 5, and 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were also raised uh, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in you all. We, we, we know that. Just as certainly as there is only one Lord Jesus Christ, there is also only one baptism. Just as certainly as there is only one faith, the faith, Jude verse 3, that has been once for all delivered to the saints. You know, that that kind of settles that about the, the faith uh, that has been revealed to us. Once for all. Uh, you know, that, that takes care of it. There's, there's not something else coming down the road. Whenever God says something as conclusive as that. But just as there is only one faith, there's also only one baptism. Just as there's only one God and Father, there's only one baptism. Just as there's only one Holy Spirit of God, there's only one baptism. And so we need to approach this with, with that, that mindset. We spent, uh, we spent six weeks, do you remember? You, we spent six weeks in the, the last two weeks of November and, and four lessons in in, in, uh, in fact, the last three, because I only had three lessons, uh, we, we went down to, uh, uh, to Denver, or no, to Fort Worth for Christmas uh, at our son's house. And, and, uh, but we had six lessons on baptism. And we, and we looked at baptism, we looked at baptism, we looked at baptism, and, and I'm not going to say that, that virtually everything that could be taught about baptism we covered in those six weeks, but we covered a lot. And God says there's only one baptism. So... When we come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, see, and this is also a process of how we study. Not only am I telling you how I study, but I'm going to, we're going to have some suggestions uh, as we, we study about how to handle the, the Word of God and what's going on. So we, we keep it in contact. We look at, at individual words and, and, you know, what stands out in, in this whole chapter. Well, in this whole chapter, the resurrection stands out. So he's talking about baptism in light of documenting and confirming that there's going to be a resurrection. And in the conclusion he comes to with them and, and, and wanting to help them because some of them didn't, weren't saying it that way. There, there, there were some of them who were saying, well, there is no resurrection. That's, that's sin because that's false doctrine. There is a resurrection. And so if, there, if there's a resurrection, then there has to be a death and a burial. And so when, whenever, uh, whenever we see in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29, that he's talking about baptism, then it's, it's got to have connection to the resurrection. And that's exactly what he says, that if there is, is no resurrection, then why, why are we baptized? Ephesians chapter 4. All right, so go with me. We're going to look at, at uh, five or six verses here real quickly. They're not lengthy. Uh, you may not even have to turn there. Uh, you're familiar enough with the Word of God that, that you probably already know these verses that we'll be reading. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. We're going to establish some things uh, that God is talking about here because of the Word that He uses. Not only baptism, but He uses baptism for the dead. All right, so we're going to look at dead in our relationship, in our relationship with God. He's talking about resurrection in our relationship with God, so we're not going to step out of that. He's talking about he brings baptism into it, so it's got to be involved in our relationship with God. And he mentions for the dead. All right, let's put, let's put that in here, and, and because God put it here. And so what does he say? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Is that true? Is that true? Of course it's true. We've all been dead in our trespasses and sins, unless we're little children. And we're not, we're not even going to, to try to convince somebody of what is the actual, if there is an actual age of accountability. 
Sometimes people want to go over, over to Jesus uh, going to the temple at age 12. And we say, all right, that's, that's whenever he officially, uh, in the Jewish system, uh, be- became uh, a young man. He, he, he is a man. But of course, he's, when, when a boy reaches age 12, he's still not a man. He, he's still not a man. He's still a boy. He's a 12-year-old boy. But the, the process is, is moving on. Or, or if we go back to the Old Testament and see the shadow of what was coming, God says in Deuteronomy chapter 1, reminding them of what had happened during their, their wilderness wanderings whenever they came to Kadesh Barnea uh, and they wouldn't go in, uh, even though Joshua and Caleb said, God's given us this land, let us go up quickly and possess it. Uh, and the people listened to the ten instead of the two. You know what, what was happening there. And God says, okay, because you said, I told you to go and you said no, now you can't go. Now I'm not going to let you go. Because it's because of unbelief. Hebrews will talk about that. Referring back to the very same thing. It, because of your unbelief, you're not going to get to go. And God emphatically says, now, because you said no to me, now you cannot go. And the people are going, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Almost sounds like a teenager, doesn't it? Anytime mom or dad says, especially dad, anytime dad says no, sometimes that, that, that uh, teenager he goes, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know, we don't like that word no. And, and God says, no, you cannot go. So the people decide on their own that they're going to go. And you know what happened. There's over 20,000 of them that died because God wasn't with them. And he says, now, you, you know, Moses says, For, forgive them. God wants to kill them all. And, and Moses says, forgive them, God. Forgive them, God. You know, if somebody has to die, let it be me, but forgive them. And God does. God forgave them, but He said they're still going to bear the consequences of what they've done. They will know, they will know, and all of their generations will know that what they did was, was rebellion against me. What they did was sin. And so He says all of those that are 20 years of age and upward will die in the wilderness. They'll never enter into the land of, of promise except the two spies that said Yes, we need to go and go quickly. We need to go and go quickly. Very, very interesting. And, and that was Joshua and Caleb. And, and they did enter 40 years later. But, but Mo- Moses didn't. Well, it wasn't because of the sin at Kadesh Barney. It was because of other sin. And Aaron had already died. And so those two men were the only ones that went in. And in Deuteronomy chapter 1, God says that, that he, he overlooked those that were 20 and under because they had not yet reached that age where they knew the difference between right and wrong. He'll also refer to that whenever he's talking about the, the, the destruction of, uh, of, of the city of Nineveh, whenever, whenever Jonah goes there and, and God has, has heard and seen their repentance and, and their cries for, for mercy, and, and uh, Jonah doesn't like it. He wants God to go ahead and destroy them. And, and God said, uh, you know, where's your heart? You know, where, where's your heart in this? And, and he talks about all those people that are there and even those that are so young that they really don't know their left hand from their right. Well, that's another way of saying that they have not reached that age where they know the difference between right and wrong. And God says, you know, you, you want me just to destroy them too? You know, you know what, what's going on there? And, and so when, when, when we're looking at being dead in, in our trespasses and sins, that describes all of us. See that word dead there. Now go to chapter 5 in, in verse 14. He's talking about Christians. He's talking about brothers and sisters in Christ after they have become children of God by obedient faith. After they have repented of their sins, after they've been uh, confessed Christ as Lord, which we were studying about this morning uh, and, and back for, for a month. And, and, and those who have been baptized into Jesus Christ, if they just lay down on the job. If they lay down a job, in, instead of always abounding in the work of the Lord, what, what they're doing is they've gone to sleep. Well, they're, they're in sin. God will deal with a church like that in, in, in the book of uh, Revelation, uh, in, in chapter uh, 3, when, when he's talking about the church at Sardis. Boy, they had a great reputation. They, they could talk about all the revivals that they had had and all the great things that they had done, and, but that was all in the past. And he said, but today you're dead. You have a name that's alive. You have a reputation that's alive. But you are dead. Were, were, they, were they born from above children of God? Yes, they were. No question about it. Just like those in, in Ephesians chapter 5. Dead. And Christ will shine upon you. 
This, this is powerful. This is important to, to notice this. That even, now before you become a child of God, it's obvious that you're dead. You're dead in your sins. You're dead in your sins. But you can fall from a good relationship with God and end up being dead again. We'll see more about that. Uh, let's go to Colossians. Uh, the, the, uh, two books later, Colossians uh, chapter 2 and verse 13. And he says almost the same thing he said in Ephesians 2 and 1. He says, and when you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven all of our transgressions. There is dead to life, death to life. You were dead, God made you alive. Go with me, if you will, to 1 Timothy. And now this is, is one where, where he's talking about someone who, who wears the name of Christ. They've gone through the process of being born into God's family, but they have turned away from God. In verse 6, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 6, talking about a widow. He says, But she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. He's talking about flesh and spirit there. She's dead spiritually even though she's living physically. He said, you, you turn away anyone. It doesn't just have to be a, a, a widow. It can be anyone that turns uh, to the sensual side of life to satisfy the lust of the flesh. They, they will be dead even while they're still living. Uh, go, go with me, if you will, back to Luke chapter 15. I, I love the, the way uh, that the Father comes back here. At the very end, the very last verse of Luke chapter 15, we, we need to see this. Uh, the, the young man comes back, the younger brother comes back, and the older brother won't go in. You know the, you know the lesson, you know the story. And so the Father goes out to him. And, and, and the, the, the one who's always been there, the one who's been faithful, is, is saying, you know, I have been here all the time. I've always done what you wanted me to do. I've never shirked my responsibility. And you've never even given me a goat. You've never even given me a baby goat to, to have, have rejoicing with my friends. But here, my brother? No, he doesn't say my brother, does he? He says, your son. Ooh, cold. That's cold. Because he's, he's already cut him off. He, he's out of here. And now he's going to be an embarrassment. He's back home. What all, you, know what, you know what all the gossip rumor mills are, are doing with that? Well, where did his money go? You know, what's going on here? And, and, and now is, does he expect to live off his father's money or off his brother's money? Because he spent all of his and, and all those things going on. But listen to what the father says. He said, but we have to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours. See how, how the father gently is instructing the son to go back. The son says, the older son says, this son of yours, and the father says, this brother of yours. Hmm. Almost sounds like my mother saying when me and my brothers would get at each other's throat, and, and it wasn't enough to say I'm sorry. Boy, that was hard to say, though. Because, see, we, we, we thought we were men. I mean, we were boys after all, and we're going to grow into men. And, and, you know, all of this, she'd say, tell your brother you're sorry. I'm sorry. She say, no, you, you tell him you're sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, given opportunity, the, the, the fight's going to continue when mother leaves. And then she, keep, she kept on. You, you say it until you mean it. Say it like, and even if you can't say it till you mean it, say it like you do mean it. I'm sorry. And then she'd say, now tell your brother you love him. Oh, mother. Oh, that's what, the that's what the dad's doing here. He says, this brother of yours, this brother of yours, tell him you love him. And we went through the whole process again. Mother was so patient. She's, I love you. And then the, the last one, boy, this was the clincher. She said, now hug him. Oh. You don't want to go there. But what does the father say? This brother of yours was dead and has begun to live again. He was lost and he's found. He was dead. Now we, under, we understand this. Now Romans chapter 6, the very last verse, Romans chapter 6 and, and uh, verse 23. For the wages of sin is what? Tell me, church. Death. I mean, we know it. And, and all of that, that beautiful teaching on baptism and, and, and who we belong to now. 
because we've been baptized by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. Now we belong to Him. We belong to Him. But so we're reminding us, the wages of sin is death. Don't, don't go there. Don't, don't let the world take you there. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-5. through 5. Read this with me. And I, I know that we could have just read one verse, but I want you to see how often God comes back to this very... who according to great mercy has caused us to be born again, actually, you know, born from above. Above. People, people have taken a very good uh, term and, and they've made it into something that God doesn't mean there. Born from above. It's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and fades and, and, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Now keep that you there. You who are protected by the power of God through faith for the salvation ready to be revealed at that last time. He said, you, you, you have something now. You have something now. You didn't have it at one time, but you do have it now because you have been born from above. You were dead in your sins. You were baptized into Jesus Christ. Now you have something. And not only is God keeping that reservation in heaven for you, but He's keeping you for the reservation. Both of them. Keeping the reservation for you, keeping you for the reservation. So don't, don't let someone take this away from us. And so now let's come back and you'll see my line of thinking here. I think you already know. In, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29, it is not a new commandment. This is not a commandment. There is nowhere where God will say, go you therefore and be baptized for someone else. It's not there. So let's be careful about reading it into this. And that's what some people have done. They've, they've taken an isolated verse, they've lifted it out of context, and, and they, they have based a, a Bible doctrine that they follow on that concept. That is not what God's talking about here. There is no new commandment. Baptism that is taught, and you remember from six weeks of it, baptism that is taught is number one, the person has to believe. The person has to believe. In Mark chapter 16, and verse 16, he that believes, doesn't he say that? And is baptized shall be saved. A dead person out there, not talking about you, someone else who is dead in their sins, dead physically even, they cannot believe. This is a personal thing. Baptism is a very personal thing. It's not a proxy thing. It never has been. The baptism that is taught in the New Testament says you've got to repent. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, they said, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus. We know that. We know that's what God tells us. And, and confession. We just finished our lessons on confession. You've got to be willing to confess. The Ethiopian official, as they're, they're going down the road, even, even, though, even though you don't hear the word baptism being taught to him, Philip taught him about Jesus. He began in, in Isaiah chapter 53, and, and he preached to him Jesus. And so obviously, he's been taught about baptism because as they're going down the road, he says, here's some water. Is there any reason why I cannot be baptized? And Peter said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So then Philip, filled with the Spirit of God, he's doing exactly what God wants done. And I don't think there's anything in the world that you could have done to Philip to get him to do something or teach something that God didn't want him to do or to teach. And so they both go down to the water and baptize him. And the man came up and he went on his way rejoicing. We know that, that belief, repentance, and confession must precede baptism. Ba in baptism, number four, we are raised so that we might walk in newness of life. It's a new life. It's like the father talking to, to his, his older son. He says, this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live again. 
That's what he's talking about here. That's what he's talking about here. So we're not looking at a new commandment. No new commandment. And everything that this verse is talking about has got to be consistent with everything else God teaches about baptism. There are no inconsistencies in the Word of God. There are some pre- pre- perceived uh, or perceived uh, inconsistencies. Or sometimes we look at something and we say, so how does this work? And, and there might be, but there, let, me, let, me, let me say, church, there is never a time where there is an inconsistency in the Word of God that has to do with a commandment. In some of the Gospel accounts, uh, and, and we'll be looking at, at those whenever we're studying about uh, how to handle the Word of God, there are sometimes whenever Jesus, in, in describing an account, uh, will, will say that there were two men with Him. And, and there will be another occasion that He'll say that there were three. And we'll say, aha, there, there was, there, there, there's a discrepancy there. There's a contradiction. No, if there's two, or if there's three, there's also how, what? Take one away and what you got? If you've got three there, then you've also got two. One of the apostles just wasn't telling us about the other people that were there. And, and, and that's the kind of inconsistency you find. You do not find inconsistencies in the commandments of God. They're simply not there. They're simply not there. God is not going to say that he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not uh, will be damned in Mark 16 and 16. And, and then in Mark 16 and 17 say... It just uh, together, and and so let's 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 not make it say something that it doesn't say, and let's also remember, let's also remember what God said through Peter in in Second uh, Peter chapter three. He says, and I, I love the way these apostles talk about each other. I love the way they talk. about. I would love to have been at an apostles' meeting just to, just to go and listen to these guys or in the book of Acts to have been there with the Jerusalem elders and the apostles because some of the Jerusalem elders were Jesus' own brothers. I mean, they were half-brothers. They were, they were the children of, of Joseph and Mary instead of God and Mary, but, but they were Jesus' brothers. James and Jude were there. And, and uh, we know that James was one of the elders there in, in Jerusalem. And, and, and in fact, we, we, history tells us a lot about his life. No reason at that point for us to think that history is not telling the truth. But, but James, James was taken the, because of the, the Jewish hardliners, the Jews that refused to accept Jesus as Lord, took James up on the top of the temple, the highest point to the temple. And, and they said to him the very same things. because See, they've read it and they've heard it. They said to James the very same things that Satan had said to Jesus, take him up to the pinnacle of the temple. He said, throw yourself off. Because God has said, God is it, quoting God, that Satan was doing that. He says, God has said he'll give the angels charge of you so that your foot will not even dash itself against the stone. And, and, uh, and, and Jesus said, you're not to tempt the Lord your God. But they take James, the brother of Jesus, up there and say the same thing to him. They say, jump off. Jump off. See if God will catch you. See if God will catch you. And he refuses to jump off. And he confesses Christ as Lord. And so what they, they, they throw him off. And there were no angels to catch him. And he died there. See, even, even the enemy knows what, what, what the Scripture has to say. Uh, but when, when, we're, when we're looking at, at consistencies, Peter, Peter talks about Paul in first, or 2 Peter chapter 3, and, and he says, even as our beloved Apostle Paul, or Brother Paul, has, has written some things that are hard to understand. Yeah, maybe, maybe this is one of them, that, that we're, we're, we're trying to, to take, it, uh, take this, this shoe and we're trying to put it in a box, and, and it, it's a box of our design. We don't have to understand this. Ooh. Did I say that? We don't have to understand verse 29. I believe God gives us plenty of information here so that we can understand verse 29. But I'm not going to argue with someone about this. If you come up and, and, and you, you say, no, that's not what it's saying at all, I'm not going to argue with you. Don't you remember what we talked about this morning? That we should not wrangle. doesn't mean you can't wear wrangler jeans. It says we, we should not wrangle about words to no profit. Because what that ends up doing is it ends up ruining 
It, it, it becomes a catastrophe in the life of the person that's listening to all of it, and often in the life of the person that's spewing it all. So there's, there's, no, there's no new commandment here, and, and there, there is no inconsistency in, in what God is saying. I want you to go to chapter 15 with me again, and we're going to begin see the, the consistent thought of, of God here in, in verse 30 and, and 31 and 32. Listen to what God is saying. He says, why are we in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. I die daily. Well, he's not physically dying daily. Oh, there may have been a, a few occasions where he actually did die when he was taken out of the city of Lystria and stoned and left for dead. But he's talking about what's going on inside of him. He, he's talking about what, what he'll say in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10 when he says, I endure all things for the elect's sake. He said, I, I, will, go through, I will go through hell itself to help my brother. That's what he'll say over in Romans. I would even give my soul to save my brother. So you don't think that's agonizing? And he realizes as God is using him to write this that he has some brothers at Corinth that are saying there is no resurrection. And he's going, then what are we doing? Why are we doing any of this if there is no resurrection? He said in verse uh, 32, he says, If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? What does it profit me? Obviously, you know, he, he's, whether he, we don't find another account that even suggests he, he did this. I don't question it. Some, some would suggest that he's using this just as an example. Maybe, maybe he was, maybe not, because people were put in the arena with the wild animals. But Paul, Paul is saying, if, if, if that's all there is to it, if that's just me going in there uh, as a gladiator and fighting against these wild animals, whether I survive or not, he says, what difference does it make? He said, if, if it's just in the flesh, what difference does it make? But it did make a world of difference. What does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. He said, that's, that's where he's, he's going with this. He, he's not trying to throw us a curve. And then in verse 33, we talked about this uh, several weeks back. In verse 33, he says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Bad company corrupts good morals. He's talking about suffering as a Christian in the hope of resurrection and how faithful you are in what you're teaching. Be, be careful with that. Be careful with that. He is not just saying, now, now it is a valid principle that you hang around with people that, that have no morals. You hang around with people that have bad morals. You have, hang around people that, have, that are amoral. That means they have no morals at all. That, that doesn't even come into play. It's going to have an influence on you. It will affect you. It will affect the way that you think, especially if they're your friends or if they're someone that, that you like or would like to be a friend with. It will affect you. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about brothers in Christ who are not standing up and teaching the truth. He's talking about brothers in Christ who are denying the truth because they're saying in verse 12, remember, keep... keep uh, Verse 33, in, in the context here, keep it in the context. They have said there is no resurrection. So I want you to go with me also to, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and listen to what he is saying. We're going to read a few verses here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 all comes back and fits right in here very well. Verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. For we who live, uh, for we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be made manifest in our mortal flesh,
right in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Some of these people are, are saying, yeah, I believe, but I don't believe in the resurrection. Well, then you really don't believe. Because that's the heart of God's message. I'm going to raise you from the dead. I'm going to cleanse you of your sin, and I'm going to raise you from the dead. I'm going to take you home to live with me forever. He's not doing that for the unrighteous people. So you, you, you deny that, and, and, and look, daily we're, we're out there facing this. I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. I know that He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sake, so that the grace which is, is, is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our out man is, outward man is, being, is decaying, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. For a momentary light affliction is producing us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not to the things which are seen, but to the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, and the things which are not seen are eternal. Be careful with this. Don't, don't go somewhere with this that we shouldn't go. And we are talking about verse 33 just a moment ago. These people were teaching error. And listen to how he closes that in verse 34. Verse 33 and 34. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought. And stop sinning. What were they, how were they sinning? They were denying the resurrection. They were denying the resurrection. Now, this, this was doctrinal perversion. He says, some of you have, have said there is no resurrection. This is doctrinal error. This is not lifestyle. When we take 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33 and say... Evil companionship corrupts good morals. You know, that, that's a lifestyle. That, that's a lifestyle thing. But, but whenever we deny that there's a resurrection, that is, is false teaching. And so he says, stop sinning. Stop sinning. He's, he's not talking about uh, how close you may be to somebody who's immoral. He's talking about the things that you're saying the things that you're teaching other people. And he said, for some have no knowledge of God. Don't give them a false impression. Don't give them a false impression. Don't say there is no resurrection. Because you're going to mislead them. And like we read this morning about uh, Hymenus and, and uh, uh, Philetus, that, that they were causing people's faith to be shipwrecked. He says, don't, don't go there with that. So this is doctrinal perversion, not lifestyle. And then he says, come to your senses. Come to your senses. He said, you should be ashamed. Oh. Those of you who are older, you know what that means? Those of you who are older, it means shame on you. I don't know whoever figured that out. I don't know. It looks kind of like a guy whittling, doesn't it? But, but that became the thing. And, and I, I remember. And you didn't want anyone saying, shame on you. Shame on you. I mean, you didn't even have to say it. All you had to do is just do it. Do this. And, and people knew exactly what you were talking about. Because we, don't, we don't want to be ashamed. And God says, then, believe and teach the resurrection. Believe and teach the resurrection. Don't, don't get people off track. Don't get people off track. It may be tonight that you are off track. I don't think so. But it may be tonight that you are. Maybe there are things going on in your life that I don't know about or the rest of the body doesn't know about. And, 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 and don't be in a position where, where God would say to you, you ought to be ashamed. No, you need to stand up and, and, and confess Christ as Lord and, and, and that you not only confess Him as Lord, but that you believe Him. And if you believe God, if you believe Christ, it means you believe everything He says. Everything He says. And if you don't, He's not your Lord. He's not your Lord. So if you need help in any way tonight, come quickly while we stand and sing. I stand to praise you, but I fall on my knees.